Hi everybody, good morning and it's so wonderful to be here. I'll be talking about the science behind cinema. So let me start by saying, what is cinema? Cinema can be defined as an amalgamation of all art that affects every aspect of our lives. It has the ability to invoke in us passion, imagination, and a diverse set of emotions. This multifaceted art uses different stimuli, such as music, sound, and pictures to create a unified ambience in the theater and give us, the viewers, a wonderful experience. But I'm the kind of person that believes that you can use science to define everything. So this brings me back to say a very cliche dialogue that science is everything and behind everything there is science. And even if you talk about cinema, I do, feel, I do believe that the neuroscientific aspect of filmmaking is something that's absolutely fascinating. And I hope that by the time I'm done with my talk today, all of you would have something to take back with you. So let me dive straight into the topic. I'd like to start the session with a question. How many of you here have seen the movie Drishyam? Could you please raise your hands? Yes, I see majority of you have actually seen the movie Drishyam. So let me take you back to a scene where the police officer actually got the location of the dead boy's body from the youngest daughter, right? The body was said to be buried in a pit behind George Kuti's house. You had the police officers, the villagers, different people, everybody was surrounded around the house because all of them wanted to see if they would actually find the body or the corpse of the dead boy. And if you take a look or if you go back to thinking of how your state of mind was at that point of time, I'm sure all of you would remember that you were all quite tensed or your mental and your uh, emotional state of mind was quite alarmed. Right? And the thing is, this, this didn't happen for just one person. All of you felt the same thing. You know, your emotions were riled up. There was a lot of anticipation. This, there was this adrenaline rush and everything was so crazy. And then when they do finally did dig up the dead body, what happened was that it turned out to be the body of a cow. And at that point, all of you equally, if you went back, you'd remember that you felt this state of relief. But there was also this feeling of confusion because you weren't exactly sure what was happening. And this is the exact opposite of the emotion that you were feeling just a second ago. So just, just think about it. A three minute movie scene caused such a dramatic fluctuation of events or dramatic fluctuation of emotions in your brain. And this didn't happen to a single person. If you look, if you look at all of us in totality, a majority of the audience or a majority of the people who are actually watching the movie were going through the same state of mind. So here what actually happened was our brain activities got synchronized. So a single movie scene had the capability of synchronizing the brain activity of different people having different cognitive abilities. And I found this aspect to be something truly fascinating. But again, it's not just our brain that worked here. A lot of external factors also helped this incredible plot twist. And a lot of other factors also made sure that our focus was on screen the entire time. Probably using gimmicks such as the used background score or the background music that was used helped in escalating the tension buildup of the scene. They used different camera angles and they used different shots so that our focus would be on the screen the entire time. Then they used impeccably structured editing, which again, helps to create an atmosphere. And then finally, we have to speak about the heart-touching performance of every actor. But when you think about it, not all movies and not all films have this capability of synchronizing our brain activity. And if I have to talk about the neurological aspect about it, this synchronization actually occurs not only in the auditory and the visual cortex of our brain, but it also happens in brain regions that are responsible for the formation of emotion and the perception of language. So if you look, or if you just think, around 100 movies release every year, but you don't remember all of them. Probably 10 of them might be super hits, and another five you might remember, and you might keep with you, and you might go back to watching again and again. So the reason this happens is because only movies that are structured and edited or segmented properly have the cap capacity 
to engage its audience and synchronize brain activities. And obviously, people do use cinematic techniques as well, such as editing and camera angles, etc., to make sure that the audience have the focus on the screen the entire time. But apart from this, our brain is what does most of this work. So when you look at something or when you're seeing something, the reason the visual perception seems so continuous and flow is because you guys are looking at me, you take that information. Then you're hearing me speak, you take that information. And then our brain combines all of this together and it gives you a sort of a seamless flowy picture. And this is how cinema affects the neurological structure of our brain. But it doesn't stop there. It also affects us physically. I'll explain this to you using another example. So pre-COVID times, or maybe just this year before the theaters got shut again, can all of you think of the last time that you'd gone to the theater to watch a movie that was probably released by the Marvel or DC comics? And for non-superhero fans, probably think of the last time that you'd gone to the theater and you'd seen a movie having a, a superstar, like probably Vijay or Salman Khan. I'm sure all of you sitting here would have had more than one instance where the audience or the crowd went super crazy looking at the heroic acts done by the characters on screen. But this feeling isn't just for one person. So when Captain America catches Thor's hammer, it's this unified howling, screaming and clapping and all of that. Everybody wants to do it. It's not planned or anything. Even when you're watching a scene, if your eyes tear up, you can find that people next to you also have tears in their eyes. Again, it's just a feeling. So this isn't something that you plan or this isn't something that people are like, okay, you know what, I'm going to go there and I'm going to sit and cry. No. So these, this can be more like an expression of an emotion that is shared by everybody who's seated in the audience. So what happens here is that when people show or when people express such synchronized physiological responses, there's a lot more stronger bonding emotionally and socially among people. And if you look at movies, successful movies, it's only movies that bring out such strong emotional and social bondings end up becoming a hit in the box office. And this is what everybody's after, right? All of us want to be successful. And especially as filmmakers, we all want our movies to be a hit. Because a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money is put into a production of a movie. And as a filmmaker myself, or a potential one at one point of time, and somebody who's a part of the film industry, I would also want my films to do well. But if I had to ask you what is the criteria for a movie to be successful, I could only say that it is the ability of a movie to invoke or spur the emotions in the audience, and obviously to have the audience be captivated by it for a long period of time. But what if I told you that there was a way that we could use the responses from our brain to actually create successful movies? It's a very interesting aspect, it's a very interesting concept, and it's a very new study or a new form of study that's been coming up in the last 20, 30 years. So this is where neurocinema actually comes into picture. So neurocinema is actually a branch or a field of study where people try to understand how movies affect our brain and how we respond to it. And this is done by using extremely advanced imaging technologies. And I'm sure most of you would be aware of them, like an MRI or an EEG, galvanic skin response, and other such biometric tests. So what happens here is that filmmakers can play a movie, and then they can see how the audience's brain would react or respond to it. From this, filmmakers could get an understanding of their audience. They'd get a better understanding of the preferences and experiences of the audience. And this, in turn, would help them curate more successful movies. So this neurofeedback can also help filmmakers to understand how different aspects of movies would actually affect the audience. For example, this is where neuromarketing techniques come into play. Neuromarketing is actually used by a lot of production companies and a lot of distribution companies nowadays to see, suppose you show a trailer to a group of people and you want to see whether the audience would accept it or not. These are the techniques that are actually used by neuromarketing companies. So what happens here is that some of the neuromarketing gimmicks that people use are using soundtracks or background scores. And then people would use them at varying intensities and volumes. So what happens is that if you have a particular scene in mind, the director and his team would decide what sort of music they would want to apply for that particular point of time to create or to you know stir up a particular kind of emotion. So if you have a comedy scene and if you don't put the required kind of music in the background, sometimes people not respond 
to it the way you want it to. So this is why music plays such a big importance while you're having or curating or making a scene. Similarly, when you, if you have properly structured editing techniques, it'll help the, the audience have their focus a little more on the screen the entire time because things look a little more interesting and there's no lag there. And the interesting part is that such studies have been happening for a lot of years. And probably, I think, since the early 2000s. One of, one, an example of such an effect that was studied is the Kuleshov effect. So this effect basically proved the point that the juxtaposition of a series of images together can actually create ideas and emotions in the minds of the audience. This idea was even referred to by the great Alfred Hitchcock, where he referred to this idea of film by saying that creation is based on the exact science behind audience reaction. And obviously he said this way before the concept or the idea of an MRI or such you know, fancy advanced imaging techniques were available. Why I keep speaking about MRI so much is because today in neuroscience, and I'm sure people who are seated here in the medical field would understand how important and crucial an MRI or an, FMR, an fMRI technique is actually is. Because today when you're having a brain surgery or today when a tumor is happening, this particular modality has helped neurosurgeons so much because like many, many years ago, you wouldn't have the exact location of where a tumor would be and you wouldn't be sure of whether you're operating on this side or this side. What are the regions related to your body functions? Like you have speech functions here, you have speech functions here, there's a Broca's area, there's a Vernix area. And most of the time you have tumors related or located around these particular regions. So if the, if the surgeons by mistake remove the tumor region that is overlapping areas that are connected to your speech, it'll actually make a person physically lose a particular modality of function. So with the help of fMRI, now what happens is that you can actually map the brain. You can give them certain tasks. You can see the activity and see which side of the brain they have a stronger localization of language. And if the tumor is on the same side, it will actually help the surgeons navigate around it and make sure that they don't remove any part of the tumor or any part of the brain that is crucial to a person's speaking capacity. This is one such example. So why I'm saying this is because if there's so much of advancement in science, imagine if we actually combine this science with movies to create, you know, more successful or more amazing forms of art. I need to go back to movies again now because I'm sure there, are, there would have been situations here where most of you would have watched a movie. For example, you would have seen a horror movie and there would have been a horror scene and you didn't actually get scared. And I'm sure if I ask any of you to name a movie, I'm sure all of you would actually name such funny horror movies. Similarly, they would have been showing you a comedy scene and you wouldn't have felt like laughing. And I'm sure at that point of time, you must have felt that there's something wrong with you because you didn't understand it, but I'm sorry, that's not true. The reason why a movie didn't actually bring you or let you express the correct emotion is because the movie actually failed at conveying the message that it was supposed to. And this is how neuromarketing would help because it could help filmmakers avoid such disasters. So next time a movie is releasing, if a, if a filmmaker would use these techniques, what we could do is we could get a group of people, we could show them these movies and then we could see how their brain responds to it. And if it's a hit, then obviously we don't have to make changes. But then if it doesn't work, the filmmakers would know that, okay, this aspect needs to be changed, this thing needs to be worked on, the music here needs to be worked on, etc., etc. And this is how neuromarketing would actually help movies be flop-proof. But these techniques are extremely expensive and they're quite difficult to bring into the film industry. But if we actually do the math properly, I do believe that using such techniques would make films be blocks, you know, absolute blockbusters. And then the amount of money that people would spend on such neuromarketing techniques would almost be nil to nothing compared to the amount of profit they would get from showing these pictures on screens. Personally, I do believe that the industry really needs to get, you know, bring up its game or up its game. And I do believe that these neuromarketing techniques or these neuromarketing strategies definitely could be the future or a, they do have a potential to be a game changer for the way the future of cinema actually goes. Thank you so much for having me here.